that you reach down and you touch, touch, touch your children. Oh, Lord, you know where we need that touch the most. Breathe, Holy Spirit, your life, your love. Lift us, Holy Spirit. Lift us like a gust of breath. Lift our hearts, lift our souls, lift our spirits. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are here loving us, lifting us, redeeming us, and giving us hope that will never, ever disappoint. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, Psalms 150 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his holy house of worship. Praise him under the open skies. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his magnificent greatness. Praise him with the blast of the trumpet. Praise him with the strumming with strings. Praise him with the castanets and dance. Praise him with the banjo and the flute. Praise him with the cymbals and the big bass drum. Praise him with the fiddle and the mandolin. Yes, Let every living, breathing creature praise the Lord. Come on, say it with me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you praise and honor and glory. We're here to praise him. Hallelujah.
Lord. All right, Hope Center, we're just here to be in the very presence Amen. of the Lord. You, Lord. Sarah said something, you know, we always pray before we come out here. And she was praying and she says, you know, not everyone in the world is able just to come together like this and freely worship the Lord. It is an honor and a privilege for us to have the freedom that we have to worship him. Amen? Amen. Well, the Bible says in Revelations 21, 14, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or sadness. There will be no more crying or pain. Soon and very soon, we will come. You're going to see the king. Oh, my God. 
kings and the Lord of Lords. Praise the Lord for that. You know, as worship singers, sometimes we go through things and maybe it doesn't seem like it, but, but we still have to get up and do what God has called us to do and worship the Lord and lead you into worship. And it is our privilege to do that. And so no matter what we face or what you face, we all know that it is well, it is well with our souls. Psalms 48 one says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. Receive that, amen, for your life, no matter what you're walking through.
you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I know no one out there can say, thank you, Jesus. I told you no one out there can say, thank you, Jesus. Oh, no one is saying, thank you, Jesus. Oh, you're so shy. All you got to do is say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. They talking about the Rams coming to California. Hey, Jesus Christ is here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We pray that the Lord will just continue to honor Hope Center of Christ because we know that he possesses the absolute truth the absolute truth that the world fights against all the time but we know that he is victorious amen? amen and so today's reading will be from the book of first john chapter one uh, john is writing from ephesus to the citizens in jerusalem because there's a problem the christians are being scattered there after a generation they're being scattered in jerusalem uh, they're declining in their commitment to almighty the Lord Jesus Christ, they're conforming to the standards of the world and they're failing to stand up for Christ and they're compromising their faith and they're listening to false teachers. And so John opens this letter by saying, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message that we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, <laughs> we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. In the name of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, dear Heavenly Father, may you reign forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And may we never compromise your word or your teaching in Jesus Christ's precious name. And Hope Center of Christ, we said, amen. Thank you.
today is that Sunday where we get the wonderful, awesome privilege and pleasure of being able to participate in Holy Communion, the first Sunday of every month. And so I'm going to ask Paul and Debbie Lips, if you'll come down, you're going to be helping to serve. And this is when we remember, we remember, we participate in this this beautiful remembrance of Jesus and what he did for us, how he gave his life for us and what that means for us. It's a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful, wonderful time. And so for those of you who are new to Hope Center of Christ, what we do here, different churches do it different ways. We, well, we, I was going to say we have an open table. We also have a spilt table. Um, <laughs> Uh, sorry, ladies. I think I've completely stained your beautiful setup here. But this is what it means here at Hope Center Christ. Wow, now I have to completely re... Okay, get yourself together, Sheila. I can do this. Um, I can say, honestly, that I do have the klutz gene. I know who gave it to me. It wasn't my mother. <laughs> and I passed it on to my son, a couple of my sons, and so any rate, I do have it. It's for the, this is just an awful mess. All right, you'll see it when you come up here. Any rate, but that's the beauty of, of communion. We make a mess of our life, don't we? Yes. All on our own. It. And Jesus comes and sheds his blood, broke his body to cleanse our messes, right? Thank you, Lord. So when you see this mess, just think about that, that Jesus has come to clean up all our mess. And so he has. So what we, here's how it ha we work. The mean, by an open table, we mean that all are welcome. If you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please come participate in the communion. We have people come forward, come, come and take the, um, you'll have a wafer that you will take from here. They're slippery. Um, don't worry about it. I've seen people get a little nervous. Remember, you're, you're, if you fumble that, it's not near as bad as mine. So you take, you take the bread, this represents the bread, the body of Jesus, and you will dip it in the grape juice, the, which represents the blood of Christ, and take both. And again, this happens every time. Sometimes people take the bread, they eat it, and then they need another one, and that's okay. This is all about God's grace through his son, Jesus Christ. So now I'm going to bless the bread, and I'm going to actually read it. Thank you, Debbie. Because the Lord Jesus, the same night he was portrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he knew what lay ahead of him. He knew what this represented, but he still gave thanks. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. For you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup, the cup. And when they had supped, he said, This cup, this is the New Testament, the new covenant, the new, the new grace that you find only in my blood this do as often as you drink it drink it in remembrance of me so lord god almighty thank you that you have come you've come to redeem our messes you've come to wash us and you see us clean and pure and white as snow thank you lord we ask you now, before we come to this table, forgive us. Forgive us. Forgive us of our sins. And thank you that they are now cast into the deepest, deepest, deepest ocean, far, far away. We could never even find it if we wanted to go look for it again. It is gone. It is redeemed. We are redeemed. So it is well with our soul. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Woo! 
pray there is power unshakable power in the blood of Jesus Christ dear Heavenly Father we thank you so very much for allowing us to participate in this supper with you Dear Heavenly Father, we know that you have made us a new creation. The old has passed away. And because we are believers, we are new men and women today. There's power in your blood, dear Heavenly Father, because in your blood you restore new life. You restore healing. You restore, dear Heavenly Father, our faith in you. And dear Heavenly Father, we receive your Holy Spirit. Receive us, dear Heavenly Father, into your kingdom as we've made a decision here today to live for you, to work for you, to be yours, dear Heavenly Father, and yours alone. Dear God, thank you in the name of Jesus Christ for your love and for the hope and the joy and the peace that you shower down upon us. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. And hope center of Christ is said. God is good, isn't it? Amen. It's kind of difficult to come from praising and worshiping him and to come to announcements. <laughs> uh, but we must do this. We like to welcome all of our guests 
that are here with us today. We also like to welcome those that are viewing us via the internet. And we like to invite those that are visiting today and those that are on the internet. If you don't have a church home, please choose Hope Center of Christ, where we believe in teaching the word of God. You may want to prepare your hearts for tithes and offerings. In front of you, there's an orange card that we call our connection card. Thank you. That is the way we stay in contact with you. We are also able to pray with you. Let us know what prayer requests you may have. And if your prayers are being answered, by all means, let us know that they are being answered. Be an encouragement. If you're here and don't know, we have Bible study during the week. We have the Women of Hope. We have the Band of Brothers. When we have the Single Hearts for Christ. And we have Hope Seekers. If you have any questions about any of our Bible studies, please see Susan Austin. Today after the service, we will have our communion potluck. We ask that everyone participate. We have enough at that table for everybody that's here. So don't feel like you don't want to come because you haven't bought anything. <laughs> we don't ever feel like you need to bring anything but yourself. And come out and fellowship and get to know each other better. Mother's Day celebration. Next Sunday, the 8th, all of you who, have, who I've seen, I've never seen your mothers, bring them if you have them. Bring them. And if those have gone on, let's come anyway and pray for those. And let's just share how wonderful it is to celebrate Mother's Day. I know little JJ will be here. Hmm. And then the following Sunday will be Pentecost Sunday, May 15th. We look forward to seeing each and every one of you here. So as we prepare for our tithes and offerings, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the abundance that you've given to us, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, let us always stay in an attitude of gratitude because we can't begin to imagine how many blessings you have showered upon us. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that as the offering comes forward, that it comes forward from those with a cheerful heart, giving of their tithes and of their offerings. They know, dear Heavenly Father, that without you, we would have none of it. And so, dear God, we bring our tithes and offerings to you in full faith. That you will honor it. And that it will grow and cause the hope center of Christ to grow and to be an instrument for your kingdom. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Son of Man will come. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, church, for joining us today. Well, many of you know that a few years ago I had to go back and I had to apply to be a substitute teacher. And when I did, I had to go and have my fingerprints taken again. No, even if you've already had a certificate of clearance as a teacher by the Department of Justice to make sure you're safe to be with children, they make you go through that anytime you move to a new location, a new site, a new school. They want to make sure that you are safe to be with their children. So I went down, I applied at three different schools, they all hired me, um, and, but I had to go get my fingerprints done. And you know, it was really, really interesting because it's been a long time since I'd had my fingerprints done. And I, put, I rolled my thumb, and now they do it all electronically, in case you know. It's not you roll it in ink and then on a piece, on a card. It's all electronic, and then the computer comes back and tells you if your fingerprints came through clearly or not. They could not get clear impressions of my fingerprints. Time after time after time, I'm going, what in the world is, is going wrong here? And they kept trying, and they kept trying. And finally, somebody had the courage to tell me, well, Sheila, you know, well, actually, I'll take it this way. She said, do you work in the garden a lot? And I said, no. She said, are you a nurse and you're washing your hands a lot? And I said, no. And she said, well, it's probably because you're old and, and your fingerprints have worn down. So I could go out and I could get away with you know what. I, my fingerprints don't show up much anymore. It was really troubling me for some time until when my husband went and applied at Disneyland. He had the same problem. His fingerprints were too old, too. We had a hard time getting our fingerprints. Did you know that? I had no idea. They had a hard time identifying my husband and me. And once they did, they, it's, all they had was our name, right? That's all they had. But what lies behind the fingerprint? What lies behind that? Once they identify you, who are you? Who are you? Not just your position in life, not just your purpose in life, not just your performance in life. Who are you? Because too often we as a society, have a, we tend to measure and define our identity based on those things. Our position, our role, as a mother, as a wife, as a father, as a son, as a friend, as a church member, as a, according to your, your career. We tend to identify ourselves based on our positions in life. We also have a tendency to identify ourselves by our purpose in life. What, why are we living? What are we doing? And we also have a tendency to I base our identity on our performance. How well am I doing all those things? Have, have I been successful or have I lacked success? Am I getting affirmations or not? Rejection, the converse. That what the problem is when we base our identity on our position, on our performance, and even on our purpose, we are trying to base our, our identity on what we do not who we are. And it's really important to make the distinction because today we know that the world and especially the society is screaming at us that there's an identity crisis going on all around us. And it's not just individual, it's society as a whole. Society tries to put labels on people in an attempt to try to rectify this identity crisis. Well, maybe if you can identify yourself, have a label, maybe then you'll have a better idea of who you are. If you're a millennial or a baby boomer, does that help you with your identity? It doesn't, no, it doesn't. But who are you? That's today's message. And I'm going to read to you, this is a little sensitive, this is a little tough message to give, and I'm going to tell you 
that there are times when we pastors feel that the Lord wants us to address an issue, and it's not easy. It's not easy. And today is not a typical message for me where I'm going to tickle your ears. This is a message, but it's an important message because our society is grappling with the issue of identity. New York Times, October 2015, not that long ago, very recent. Wesley Morris wrote this. The title of the piece was, The Year We Obsessed Over Identity. That's the title. The subtitle is this. 2015's headlines and cultural events have confronted us with the malleability, meaning the changing, the, ch the malleability of racial, gender, sexual, and reputational lines. Who do we think we are? Now this is a secular article, and he talks about in there how we as a society are feeling this, he calls it an obsession with identity, I would call it an identity crisis as a society as a whole. And I, you know, I would say that the article was truly focused mainly on the transgender and the transracial, which I'd never heard of and I'd never read about. Now, whether or not we agree with the article, and I'm going to get into that, I want you to, first of all, you, the minute I said those words, I can just feel all those little pricklies going up all over the, all over the room. And nobody's sleeping through that now, right? I, because I use the word trans. Right? I did. And I'm going to tell you that we as a church are also trans. Oh my goodness gracious, Sheila, I thought, no, get, bear with me, hang in there with me. We are trans political. You've heard me say it, this is not new. Not new. We are trans political. We do not take political issues here. We do not take sides. We are apolitical as a church. We've made a very, very uh, prayerful and careful decision to do that, following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, who was pressured to be political and to pick it when he as the Messiah. The, the people thought the Messiah was a political figure, and Jesus said, no, do not put me there. I will not do that. That's not why I came, because political systems come and go. And all of these political things, including this current political climate within which we're living, is going to come and go. It's all transitional. And so we are trans. We want to transcend all of these labels, we want to transcend the political. So I'm going to ask you to do something very difficult today. I'm going to challenge you to take all of those political feelings you have and put them in the back trunk of your car for now. Because I want to have you here. We need to realize that this issue that people are, that the, what is really, I agree, first of all, I have to say, I agree wholeheartedly with the article in the fact that we do have an identity crisis. We do. There's no question about it. I agree with that. And I'm going to get to what I bet. I believe that the world is addressing this, this identity crisis in the wrong way in a misleading way. And that's what I want to get into. I want to ask you to, hum humbly to ask you to stay with me because I also agree with the article that identity is important. That's why it's such a hot issue. Identity is important. People, who we are. Who are you? But today it is important for us as a church when we live and we see and we hear almost daily 
news articles that are dealing with this whole identity crisis. It is important for us as a church to be able to, and us as Hope Center of Christ, as Christ's disciples, as we seek to be as much like Christ as possible, as we seek to share his gospel message as much as Christ likes possible, to, we want to, I want to help you today to begin to join in this discussion, this very, very important discussion, in a loving and biblical way. Both. Doesn't have to be one or the other. There are various ways to look at the phenomenon of identity. There's a social, political, which we will, I will not do. I will not address that. And I actually think that's a huge, big distraction. But there's also the psychological and the spiritual, and that's what I'm going to address today. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not going to be addressing this at, through the science of psychology, but as a pastor, I'm going to be dealing with the feelings, with the, the point of view as a pastor. We, are, we care about people's sense of self-worth, who they are, your identity. I am concerned about the identity of you. I am concerned about the identity of all people, all people. Do not misunderstand me and think that that means I condone everything. You all know our position on that, and if you don't, I'll address it later in the pulpit. But our call as Christians is not to take political stances, but it is to take a spiritual stance, a spiritual stance, and that we need to know how do we respond as Christians based on Scripture. Can we do that in a loving way without condoning? Now, I know I'm nervous about this message today because I know that some of you are going to think, oh, my gosh, Sheila just preached a whole message on tolerance, which I'm not. And others of you will, will say, Sheila was, she teached a whole message on intolerance, which I'm not. And others of you will say, Sheila sat on the fence. She didn't take a side. You know, you run that risk. I will tell you that I'm, the message I'm giving you today is based on the Bible, as much as I can possibly find it. And, if, and feel free to join in the conversation with me as we move along. We do have an identity crisis. I do agree with the New York Times article. I do believe that it is a crisis of a society as whole, who are we as a nation? Who are we as a people? Who are we as a community? And who are we as Christians? Who are we? Who are we? And we're grappling with it. We are, uh, we are tra grappling. And I would argue that crisis is real, but I would also argue that identity crisis trans, there's that word again, it transcends gender and racial identity. I'm going to say that again in case you missed it. Identity crisis transcends gender and racial identity. It's bigger than that. It's more than that. That's one issue, one manifestation of the fact that there is an identity crisis. And all people, I would argue that all people everywhere is dealing with an identity crisis in various forms. The world is at a loss as to how to handle it and how to heal it. The, real, the problem is that we have said, go find yourself. That's what the world has said. Go find yourself. Be yourself. And the problem is that the, I see the more we try to find ourselves, the more we try to re reinvent ourselves, the more we try to define who we are according to the world or according to ourself, the more we try to find ourselves, the more we are losing ourselves. My concern is this. The world is stealing the true identity of God's children. That's my concern. The world is stealing the true identity of God's children. Does that not make your heart break? And that's because 
The world is focused on attempting to heal our identity by addressing it superficially. I'm going to give you an example, and it's about me, because in this very sensitive topic, I think I don't have to worry about hurting my own feelings. Although I did when I tipped and spilled the communion cup today, my gosh. But I can laugh at myself. But okay, me. If you don't know, I am a full six feet tall. My mother used to say, Sheila's 5'12". I want to say, Mom, I'm not. I'm six feet tall. One day when I was in high school, and I, boy, I grew overnight. And I was standing there with a group of my friends, and I happened to see a reflection of, my, of this group, right? And there was me. Wow! Standing way taller than everybody else. And I was like, no! I don't want to stand out like this. I don't look like I fit in. Who wants to stand out and not fit in in high school? Not me. Not Most people don't. I wanted to be normal. I wanted to fit in. What were my options for dealing with my six feet high? Right? Slouched. I slouched. Stood like this, you know, on one foot. I thought, I think I lowered myself a couple inches there. All I did was reduce, I, did, I was not successful at really reducing my height, but I did reduce my stature in my desire to be less than God made me to be. I was in danger of believing the lie that God had not made me good enough or beautiful enough. I was in danger of believing that lie. I, ha I was in danger of believing that God made a mistake when he made me that tall. My identity and self-esteem was in danger of being compromised because I was looking at my identity at the shell, at the superficial shell of who I am, who I was. Now, I share this as self-disclosure because I want you to hear that I believe that the world is looking for identity in all the wrong places. They're because they're focusing on the superficial, they're focusing on the, on the shell. How tall are we? What do you wear? How much hair do you have, if any? Another thing we've done is, do I have more melatonin than you or less than? We do, we do compare, do we not? Our skin color with each other. And I think one of the most beautiful things that ever happened to me at this church was at one of our church picnics and Dr. Thomas was sitting next to me. And Dr. Thomas's skin is much, much darker than mine. Let me just put it that way. And he took his beautiful doctor hands and he put them right on my white, 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 Ugh, white, pasty white arm. And he said, he said, Sheila, you are really fair. And I said, yes, I am, Dr. Thomas. And then I said to him, because he's from the Caribbean, I said, you know, I've had this kind of theory, and you're a scientist, you've studied this as a doctor. Is there any truth to my little theory? And that is because my ancestors all came from the Netherlands where it's cloudy and, and there's not much sun. And so my skin probably wouldn't handle sun very well, right? But, it, but you are, come from the, closer to the equator where there's more sun, and you, do you, does your skin need more melatonin to protect it from the sun? And he said, oh my gosh, Sheila, yes, that's very true. He said, not only that, but he said, and I wish he were here this morning because he's having trouble with his back, so we need to pray for him. But, but he said, this is what he said to me. He said, not only that, but he said, my nostrils are wider than yours so that I can intake air quicker to cool down my body. And he went on to explain how God created these beautiful, uh, these uh, beautiful bodies because he knows, he knew that this is, there's a reason for it. So there's a reason why 
He has given us some of these things, but let us not find our identity in what we wear, how tall we are, how short we are, how skinny we are, how fat we are, how much melatonin we have in our skin, how little melatonin we have in our skin. If our hair is straight or skinny, straight or, sorry, straight or curly. <laughs> I told you I was nervous about today's message. But we're grappling with this issue, okay? We're grappling, we're wrestling with it. And society, society is at a loss as to how to deal with this identity crisis. And you, guess what? The church has the answer. We have the answer. We know, we know that the harder you try to find yourself, the more likely you will be to lose it. Some of you have Bible verses springing to mind already when I say that. We know that, and we know who the real identity thief is. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy our identity. Because he knows if we can be persuaded to find our identity in the world, then he can use our accomplishments as well as our failures, approval as well as rejection to ignite an identity crisis. You see, it's not just failure that makes you have an identity crisis. It can also be success, really? Yeah. Because you're basing your identity on your success, which may or may not last. And even if, and the more successful you are, and then if it doesn't last, boy, then you've really got an identity crisis. It's a, it's a lose-lose if you try to build your identity on your accomplishments, on approval, one way or the other. Because there are times in life, I guarantee you, you will not, you will not, you will not, you will not live up to everybody's expectations, including your own. You will not. You will fall short. You will fall short of their hopes, their dreams. And then, if that's where you based your identity, you will face an identity crisis. My son Scott is a detective. Do you know what he detects most of the time? Well, first of all, I have to tell you, my husband loves detective novels, and so one day Scott put his new calling card in one of his detective novels, and it said, said on it, Scott Coleman, detective. And then Scott wrote on the back, Dear Dad, from a real detective. <laughs> but my son Scott, his cases, and he's huge caseload, they're all identity theft. Identity theft. That's what he does. Identities are being stolen every day. Identities are being stolen every day. We know who the real identity thief is. But today's message title is, I'm just now getting to it, because I'm saving it, I want you to hear it, Identity Stolen and Redeemed. Identity Stolen and Redeemed. Christ has been redeeming identities. When people discover their soul, S-O-U-L, identity in Christ, then we are set free. We're set free from people's expectations. We're set free from having to perform. We're set free from having to have a certain position in life. We are set free. We are set free in Christ. Christ sets us free, sets us free to find out who you are. Ephesians 2.10 says this is who you are. You. You are God's handiwork. Whether you have six feet tall, you have pasty white skin, or beautiful black skin, you, you are God's handiwork. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us, for you, to do. We're going to look at, quickly at the end at a portrait of a Bible man, a biblical character. Talk about an identity crisis. Don't you think that if you have changed your name, that that's a sign that there's been an identity transformation? I would say so. We know him as, he was originally Saul, he became Paul. Talk about identity stolen 
The thieves tried to steal Paul's, Saul's identity, but he was redeemed. His identity was redeemed by Jesus Christ. Saul thought that his purpose in life, that his position in life was to root out, discover, go, and kill all these blaspheming Christians. He not only acted as detec detective, and judge. He also acted as ex 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 executioner. Executioner. We know that Paul was there when Stephen was stoned. In Acts 7 59, it says, And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So after they, after they stoned him, they brought their garments, they put them at, Saul, at Saul's feet, like, Here's our. Look at, look at the good that we did, Saul. We killed him. And then in Acts 8, 1, it says, and Saul approved of his execution. Saul didn't actually pick up the stones in that particular execution, but he definitely was in the business of executing Christians. He was proud of his position. He was proud of his purpose. He thought he'd found his true identity, when in reality, it had been stolen. And he didn't know it. Okay, take out your Bibles and turn to Acts 9. We're going to see how Saul had his identity redeemed. Acts 9, verse 1. You need more time to find it? Acts 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was, emphasis on past tense, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. And he went up to the high priest and he asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, or Christians, whether men or women, mind you, women too, women were not spared. Did you ever think about that? Men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Saul was, Saul was, past tense, Saul was. But God redeemed, as we see, starting in verse 3. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul. Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, Saul hadn't actually arrested or ex executed Jesus, although the earlier it had happened to Jesus, he was now resurrected, but he was now doing it to the Christians meaning the persecuting the Christians was the same as persecuting Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? Now get up, Jesus said, and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Verse 7 says, The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. What, G what Paul Saul at that time, what Saul saw on the road to Damascus was a theophany, it's called, a, a physical manifestation, appearance of Jesus Christ. Jesus appeared, we talked about this a few weeks ago, he appeared, the risen Christ. He appeared, the risen Christ, to many different witnesses who testified to that. And this is one more of those instances. Jesus appeared, and Paul was blinded by the light. And for three days, he could see absolutely nothing. Saul was God redeemed, and now Paul is. Think about those verbs. Those are I am verbs. Those are who are you, I am, I was, I will be, right? Saul was, God redeemed, Paul is. Identity crisis is because we've lost ourselves, 
and the way, what is the God, but yet God redeems. The world, the world does not know how to handle this, but we, the church, have the answer. The answer lies in Jesus Christ, who comes and meets us face to face and takes our brokenness, takes the old and replaces it with the new and helps us discover and find and be who we were created to be. The beauty that God has built and breathed into each and every one of us. Saul was, his identity was stolen by the thief. But he was redeemed, and now Paul is. Now, Paul, this is what he would say today to, about the identity crisis that is facing our world. Okay, turn to Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 1. Ready? And you were, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. So this is what the world needs to hear. This is the message the world needs to hear in this identity crisis. You are dead in your trespasses. You're following a thief. You're allowing him to steal your identity. That spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, they that once, sorry, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, this search for identity in all the wrong places. Do you see it? And then it says, but God. Put your finger on there. But God. But God. God, rich in mercy. Because of his great love from which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Therefore, by grace, you have been saved. You have been saved. Drop down to verse 10, because you are, here we are again, you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in him. God doesn't want us to be lost. He doesn't want us to try to redefine ourselves or to re to reinvent ourselves because in the process we lose our beautiful uniqueness. Right? What if Dr. Thomas's skin got lighter and lighter and mine got darker and darker? Where would be the beautiful contrast in that? You know? We need to all be, we need to celebrate the fact that we are God's workmanship. And if we're all the same height, there we're all, all of us are taller, all of us are short, we lose our uniqueness, the uniqueness that God has created each of us. Remember how I saw myself in high school? Well, then I went away to college. I saw myself as an ugly duckling, you might say, in college, and then, I mean, in high school, and then I went away to a college called Hope College, my dad's alumni. It's a Dutch Reformed college, and I'll never forget what happened the first time I walked into the dining room of that campus. You walked in, and there's the dining room filled with fellow students, right? I was average height. Yeah. I had found my other, my, I felt like a swan. I was like, oh my gosh, look at me. I'm right at home. I fit in with all these people because I realized the reason I was so tall, and still am, the reason is because I'm Dutch. I've learned that Dutch people are usually tall. And that was, so my identity, right? My identity. That's how God created me. 
God created me. Dutch, klutz, and all. But the enemy tried to steal my identity. The enemy tried to steal my identity. Identity is not found in the mirror. It's not found in philosophy. It's not found in performance. It's not found in position. It's not found in purpose. It's found in knowing whose you are. Not who you are. Whose are you? That's your identity. And I am. I am the daughter of I am. I am the daughter of Yahweh. I am the father's daughter, the daughter of the king of kings, his beloved. That's where I find my true identity. Identities are being stolen, but they are also being redeemed. Remember, people, remember that. Remember, fingerprints worn down. Has your identity been worn down? Has it been, are you facing an identity crisis or knows anybody else who does? When we think about this conversation and this discussion that's going on in our community, just remember, we have the real answer. The real answer. Don't worry about the shell. That's a distraction from the enemy. Worry about the soul that lives within the shell. Because what we want is for him, the maker, he already has it there, his fingerprint on your soul. May people, when they see me, may they see the fingerprint of Christ on my soul. God does. When he looks at you, he sees only your soul. The Bible says man looks on outward appearance, but God looks on the heart, the soul. And what does he see? His fingerprint. The fingerprint of God, the fingerprint of Christ, the fingerprint of the redeemed. Oh, Lord God, thank you. Thank you that you help us to know whose we are. We are yours. Oh, God, help us as we grapple with this in society to give the loving answer that you have already given, that their identity can only truly be found in you. That's the answer. That's your answer. So thank you, Lord, that it is well. It is well with our soul. Amen. Is there anybody for being with us today and I want to give you the benediction before I do I want to remind you we had today's potluck please feel free to stay even if you didn't bring anything please know that the Lord loves you and he has touched your soul he has I know that as I look at the faces out in front of me so stand for the benediction <clears throat> And now, and now, and now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace, peace that passes all understanding. May he give you faith that is unshakable, hope that is unsinkable, and love that is unquenchable. Amen.
I love you, and so does God. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? He is our identity, and we are his. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah, Hope Center.
identity is in Jesus and the Lord is your light. Hallelujah, Thank Hope you, Center. Don't forget we have our wonderful lunch and we'll see you next week. God bless you.